everybody and welcome to another midweek message. I'm Brother Wayne and I want to say thanks for taking time out of your no doubt very busy schedule to uh, join me as we look into one of our articles uh, of faith here at Northport Baptist Church from the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. This week we're exploring the article entitled Of the Perseverance of Saints. The perseverance of the saints is one of the most cherished doctrines of our Christian faith. Um, I'm sure that you have heard people talk about the concept of once saved, always saved. Uh, This is perseverance of the saints. And perseverance of the saints is the belief that those who are saved will remain saved and can't possibly lose their salvation. The knowledge that we can't lose the gift of salvation that God's given us through Jesus, it gives us great confidence in living our lives for him. Now, the way that one understands perseverance is determined in large part by what that person understands to be true about salvation. So their soteriology plays a role in how they understand perseverance. And remember that we've already talked about different perspectives or different views on soteriology. Some think that God chooses people to be saved. Others think that God knows who will be saved and that based on his foreknowledge of who will accept him, he chooses those for salvation. And then others believe that God doesn't choose anyone specifically. God just makes salvation available to all and people are completely responsible for choosing God without any uh, influence of God on that choice. Um, And so what you believe about salvation and God's activity in that uh, will determine what you will also believe about the perseverance of saints and once saved, always saved. So this is another one of those issues uh, upon which not every Baptist will agree. Uh, Free will Baptist, for example, believe that there are strong grounds to hope that the saved will persevere to the end, but they also believe a person can lose his faith in Christ, can backslide, and thus lose his salvation. So they don't understand perseverance of the saints the same way that, say, a Calvinist would understand perseverance of the saint. So let me briefly explain the difference between the three major views in this area before we move on. <clears throat> Some Baptists believe that God chooses those who will be saved. Therefore, there is nothing a person can do that will affect that choice. It's all God's choice. And since a person does nothing to be chosen by God in the first place, that person can do nothing to change God's mind in the long run. Uh, these Baptists believe that if a person is chosen by God, that person will persevere in salvation no matter what. This would be the Calvinist viewpoint. Maybe a little oversimplified, but that's basically what it is. So God chooses some for salvation, and those he chooses will persevere to the end. And in this way of thinking, the perseverance of the saints is completely dependent upon God and his choosing. God gives salvation to those he chooses. They can never lose it. Others believe that God knows, based on his foreknowledge, who will respond to the offer of salvation and that God chooses to draw those people to himself and to save those people based on his foreknowledge of their choice. With this viewpoint, there is a partnership of sorts between man and God. God knows who's going to respond favorably. God invites and then draws those to him whom he knows will respond. And then that person is responsible for responding. This whole process is based on God's foreknowledge of who he knows is going to genuinely respond to him in faith. And therefore, all those who do genuinely respond in faith are true believers 
and thus persevere to the end, or else God would have known that their faith wasn't genuine from the start and would never have chosen them for salvation in the first place. So this would be the Molinist viewpoint. And um, in this viewpoint, only those who genuinely respond to God in faith are truly saved. But those who do respond are known by God and kept by God to the end. From this way of thinking, the perseverance of saints is dependent upon God's foreknowledge of those who are genuine believers and the believer's ongoing commitment to the Lord. So God gives salvation to those who truly believe, and then they can never lose it because God knows who are truly his. Still other Baptists believe that God makes salvation available to everyone, but he doesn't elect or choose any specific individuals for salvation. <clears throat> Though he knows who will accept him in the end, he doesn't influence anyone's decision or draw any one person to him more than he does any other person. And so people are completely free to choose or reject God, and they remain free to choose or reject God even after they become saved. Thus, a person can lose his salvation if he falls into sin or moves far enough away from the Lord. Even the strongest believer in this viewpoint can backslide to a point where he could potentially lose his salvation. And such could happen even after years of faithful service to the Lord. And this would be the Arminian viewpoint. God offers salvation to all of mankind, much like a product in a store. It's available to everybody. But ultimately, a person has to buy the product. A person's salvation and their perseverance are dependent upon that person's ongoing commitment level and faithfulness to the Lord. So from this way of thinking, the perseverance of a saint is completely and utterly dependent upon the individual. God gives salvation to those who accepts it, but he can take it back if they don't remain faithful to him. Now, it needs to be said that all of this talk about perseverance doesn't mean that just everyone who calls himself a Christian is going to be saved. Just because a person self-identifies as a Christian doesn't mean that person is a genuine believer who has a relationship with Jesus. All of these viewpoints would agree on that, that somebody can call themselves a Christian but not truly be a Christian. So each of these perspectives would acknowledge that there are people in churches who seem outwardly to be Christians, but who inwardly have not made a real commitment to follow Christ, or they're not really chosen by God, and thus they will not persevere in their faith to the end. Now that I've given you the three main perspectives on perseverance held by Baptists, uh, and a little caveat to explain that just because a person self-identifies as a believer doesn't mean he truly is. Let me make a simple statement that I think will frame the rest of this conversation. I would say that the clearer teaching of the Bible is that true faith perseveres to the end. And I'm going to say that again for emphasis. True faith perseveres to the end. This is one of those faith statements that you can hang your hat on. And I believe that this statement uh, applies whether you're in the Calvinist camp, the Molinist camp, or the Arminian camp. Uh, I think all of these could agree that true faith always perseveres to the end. And this being the case, one of the greatest indicators of genuine saving faith is whether a person holds on to faith in Christ and allows that faith to shape and guide him in his life until the end of his earthly life. True faith perseveres to the end. I believe this simple statement is strongly supported by the testimony of the Bible and that it also correlates perfectly 
with the message of the article of faith that we're going to be looking at today. One more thing before we read the article. I think an analogy might help to drive home a better understanding of true faith before moving forward. Back in 1995, I married my wife. Uh, we stood before God and friends and family, and we made vows to one another. Uh, and though updated a bit, our vows were based on very traditional vows. And in those vows, we promised to love, to cherish, to protect, and to be committed solely to one another in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, until death would do us part. <clears throat> in essence, I made a commitment to my wife on our wedding day to love her more than I loved any other human being until the day that I die. Now, we live in a world where people fall in love and they fall out of love on a daily basis and divorces happen because one individual will come in and just say, I don't love you anymore. However, it's my contention that if ever a day comes when I walk in and tell my wife that I no longer love her, that very act would serve as proof that I never ever loved her in the way that I said I did on our wedding day. Why? Because built into our definition of love on that day was a statement that our commitment to one another would persevere to the end. It would carry us to the end of our life. So in a very real way, the fact that I'm still with my wife, still cherishing her, still protecting her, and remaining committed to her is proof of the authenticity of my love for her. And if it is real love, then it's going to last throughout the remainder of our lives here on earth. Because Real love, true love, lasts. It lasts to the end. So if I ever stop doing all of these things that I've talked about, cherishing, uh, protecting, loving, then I prove by my actions that my original commitment wasn't genuine because true love perseveres to the end. And so it's my contention that genuine, authentic faith is really no different. True faith perseveres to the end. In other words, a person's salvation experience represents the beginning of a relationship between that individual and God. And this is a relationship that's built upon mutual love and devotion and commitment and genuine faith. Um, if that relationship is real, it's going to stand the test of time. If the commitments made at the beginning of this relationship are real, they'll stand the, the test of time. And now here's the clincher. God never falls down on his part in a relationship. So the perseverance of our faith is somewhat determined by our own enduring commitment. However, we don't fall from true faith any more than we fall out of true love. Point being that if a person rejects Christ after seeming to follow Christ at another point in his life, that rejection is really proof in and of itself, that the person never really was committed to Christ in the first place. Thus, they haven't lost their salvation. Rather, they never really had salvation in the first place. Because true faith, the kind that saves us, is a faith that perseveres to the end. Any other kind of faith that doesn't last, that's not the kind of saving faith that uh, establishes a relationship with God. Only true faith does. And true faith always perseveres to the end. So now, with all of that having been said, let's hear what our article says. It says this, We believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end. That their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Since I spent a good little bit of time building up to the article, 
I'm going to just quickly summarize a few points this article makes and then move on to sharing some passages from the Bible that support the claims of the article. First, the article says, Such only are real believers as endure unto the end. In other words, the true test of a person's faith in Christ is whether or not that person holds on to that faith all the way to the end, or, or if that person endures to the end. A person's self-identification as a believer means nothing if that self-identification isn't proven out through their faithful endurance. As I stated earlier, a person who professes faith in Christ only to reject that faith later or to wander away from that faith is often not a real believer. Such a person may have had an emotional experience that he thinks is real, or they may have even given half-hearted allegiance to Jesus or lip service to Jesus. However, such people are not really saved because their faith doesn't last. And let's be clear, it's not that such a person loses faith in Jesus. Rather, the fact is that such a person never had true saving faith the kind of faith that was necessary to genuinely trust Christ for salvation in the beginning. So let me be clear in saying here that it is possible for a truly saved person to wander away for a time, right? Or to even fall into sin for a while. But the mark of a true believer is that he will eventually repent and come back to Christ. Uh, a, a true believer can't live perpetually in sin. He'll be miserable in that state. The Holy Spirit won't allow it in his life. He will eventually be drawn back into a right staying in a right relationship with the Lord. So it's impossible for a true believer to persist in sin. Those who do persist in disobedience and sinful living they're just not really saved. And this is what John was referring to in his first epistle when he stated in 1 John 3, 6, everyone who remains in him, that's Jesus, does not sin. Or in the Greek, it uh, would be just as, as well translated, keep on sinning. So does not keep on sinning. And that everyone who sins or keeps on sinning has not seen him or known him. So some people see salvation as a license to live however they want to live and yet still have this promise that they're going to be saved in the end and they're going to escape in eternity separated from God. Let me be clear. This is a cultural form of Christianity, and it is not true Christianity. Sadly, there are people who exist in today's church who hold a false sense of security uh, in regards to salvation because they are basing their salvation on some emotional experience they had or a series of actions that they took sometime in the past that they think somehow secured salvation for them, but these people don't really have a relationship with Jesus that defines how they live in the here and now, and thus they are not saved and they will not persevere. It's important that we understand that. Jesus alluded to the fact that there would be people who would seem, at least on a surface level, to accept the message of the gospel and appear to respond in faith, yet not have truly authentic, sustaining faith. He made this revelation in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And in this parable, Jesus talked about seed that fell onto rocky ground and seed that fell among thorns. He also talked about seed that fell along the path and seed that fell on good ground too. Those two are, are pretty clearly what he's talking about. The ones that fall on the path, the word's never implanted, and it, nothing ever comes of it, and those people are definitely not saved. The ones that the seed that falls on the ground uh, 
springs forth with a great harvest, bears a lot of fruit. This is obviously, he's talking about people who accept the gospel and are truly saved. These other two soil types, though, uh, the rocky and the thorny, uh, there's uh, different views on when you're like, what, is, what does Jesus mean by this? But Jesus is pretty clear that these are not saved people. They appear, at least to begin with, on the surface to be people who accept the word and who are believers, but then their uh, true faith is demonstrated in what comes later. In other words, the lack of true faith is demonstrated in what comes later. So um, the Jesus talked about seed that fell on rocky ground and thorny ground. Both sprouted, but neither bore fruit. The first withered because it had no root, and the latter was choked out by the thorns. And Jesus goes on to explain the parable, and he explains that these types of ground represented types of hearts of people who hear and respond to the gospel. Some, like the seed that fell among the rocky ground, seem to respond quickly to the gospel but then they fall away from faith due to hardship or persecution. So when living for Jesus gets difficult, they decide not to live for Jesus anymore. They just live for themselves when times get tough or when the demands of Christianity and the uh, expectations of Jesus become too much for them and they don't really want to do the things that Jesus tells them to do. Uh, they they just abandon Jesus. Uh, some uh, respond quickly uh, in faith only to have their faith choked out by a pursuit of worldly cares. Okay, so uh, they initially seem to be real believers and maybe even get really excited about the possibility of following Jesus but then later on, they become worldly in their thinking and in their living and the pursuits of, of worldly things becomes more important to them than their pursuit of Jesus. And so Jesus, he doesn't suggest in this parable that either of these two soils represents a person who genuinely receives the message of the gospel in faith. The only truly saved heart is the one that receives the word, bears fruit, bears a harvest, and perseveres until the harvest time, which in this case, uh, in this parable, would be either our death or the return of Jesus. The harvest is at the end of time or when we die. So our article clarifies that a persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes real believers from superficial professors. So the, the stony ground and the thorny ground, these would be what we would consider superficial professor, uh, professors. On the surface, they seem to follow Jesus, but really deep down inside in their hearts, they haven't made him their Savior and their Lord, so they're not truly saved. Okay? Persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark that distinguishes real believers. Uh, I've heard it said before that the proof is in the pudding. I know you've probably heard that as well. In other words, you show with your actions what is real to you, or as I've gotten in the habit of saying a lot lately, your actions demonstrate the realness of your attitudes and your affections. What you believe is always borne out in behavior. And that's because belief precedes behavior. That's something that I've been teaching our church lately. Belief precedes behavior. What you believe will ultimately be borne out in the way that you behave. And so you can tell what somebody truly believes just by watching the way that they live. So if a person's actions don't demonstrate an enduring faith in Christ, the most likely reason is that that person doesn't have saving faith. Superficial professors look like the real thing, uh, at least initially. 
but they have shallow roots and their shallow faith is easily choked out by the cares of this world. Jesus himself warned that in the last days, uh, in Matthew 24, 10 through 13, that many will fall away, betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and multiply. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Obviously, Jesus did not believe that those who fall away were true believers, and he did not hold out any promise that such would receive eternal life. James, the half-brother of Jesus, taught that the reward for a believer's faithful endurance is eternal life. Note what he says in James 1.12. He says, blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Uh, the writer of Hebrews also acknowledges the importance of endurance for the believer, stating in Hebrews 10, 36, for you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. Paul explained the importance of staying rooted in one's faith in his letter to the Colossians. In Colossians 1, 21 through 23, he said, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So Paul clearly articulates that perseverance in our faith is integrally connected to authentic reconciliation. If we do not remain in the faith, that is proof that we were never really in the faith. And this is exactly why 1 John 2.19 says the following about those who abandoned their faith in Jesus. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. So true believers persevere and stay in the faith until the end and eternal life is only offered to those who persevere in faith until the end. Now, the article ends by telling us that a special providence watches over the welfare of true believers and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Basically, the article is telling us that the genuine and authentic faith that secured our salvation is the same faith that enables us to persevere to the end and realize salvation. But remember that salvation is provided by the grace of God through faith. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 teaches us that. Therefore, just as God is the ultimate provider of grace through faith at the beginning of our relationship with him, and just as God provides the grace that will result in our ultimate glorification in the end, so God also provides the grace necessary to carry us through as we persevere in our faith. Remember that God's Holy Spirit regenerates the believer. We talked about this when we talked about regeneration. He regenerates the believer and begins a process of sanctification, what we talked about last week, in the life of the believer at the moment of salvation. Um, perseverance is inextricably tied to the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Those who have genuine faith, they come to be indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, and God's Spirit begins to do a work in that person's life that leads to ever greater degrees of sanctification. We've talked about all of this up to this point, so this is not new information. A divine partnership exists between a saved person and God. That individual persists in faith, but is also carried along in their faith by God's Spirit within. And such a person can no more deny 
Christ or ignore the work of God's Holy Spirit in his life or refuse to participate in that work, then he can deny or ignore himself. It is this person's genuine saving faith in Christ that provides both a desire to persevere and the power to persevere in faith to the end. So to sum things up, this article basically, and but very clearly, teaches that not every person who claims to know Jesus is the real deal, and those who are the real deal are known by their perseverance and their endurance in the faith. And God knows those who are truly His, and He carries them through life with the promise that they'll receive salvation as a reward for enduring faith. Um, Note a few verses uh, as we close. John 8, 31 through 32. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you continue, then you really are. John, uh, 1 John five eighteen. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin or does not go on sinning or keep sinning. But the one who is born of God keeps sin and the evil one does not touch him. Job 17, 9. Yet the righteous person will hold to his way. Talking about God's way. And the one whose hands are clean will grow stronger. Jeremiah 32, 40. I will make a permanent covenant with them. This is God making a promise through the prophet Jeremiah. I will never turn away from doing good to them, and I will put fear of me in their hearts so that, get this, they will never again turn away from me. Never again. Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this, Paul says, that he, talking about God, who started a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God's not going to give up on those who are truly His. Philippians 2, 12-13 Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, make sure that you're the real deal. Uh, analyze yourself, evaluate yourself, make sure that your salvation is the, that your faith is the genuine, true, saving kind. He goes on to say, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So those of us who are truly saved, God's Holy Spirit inhabits and he does his work in us to bring about his purpose and plan in our life. 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, talking about the things and people of the world, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. In John 10, 27 through 29, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And so, those Jesus knows, they follow him, they're his, they cannot lose their place with Jesus. They cannot lose their salvation. They'll persevere to the end. Um, you know, if you were to ask me today how I know that I'm still committed to my wife, how I know that I'll be committed to the end, uh, I wouldn't point you to a ceremony that happened way back in 1995. I wouldn't show you a ring. Uh, I wouldn't talk about the butterflies that I get when I think about her. Uh, rather, I would tell you that I love my wife just as much today and that I'm just as committed to her today, maybe even more so than I was on the day that we got married. The, the same is true in regards to my salvation. 
I'm not saved because I went through some motions when I was seven. I'm not saved because I walked down an aisle. I'm not saved because I prayed a prayer. I'm not saved because I got baptized. I'm not saved because of any of that stuff that I did when I was a kid. I'm saved because I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm committed to him right now. I love him right now. And he has a relationship with me. My salvation isn't based on how an experience I had in the past made me feel better. Rather, I know I'm saved because right now I have a relationship with Jesus on the basis of faith. I love him, I trust him, and I'm committed to him as he is to me. And I believe with all my heart that it's that faith that is going to sustain me all the way up to the end of my time here on earth. Friends, it is of utmost importance that we believers evaluate ourselves to make sure that we are truly in the faith. We can self-deceive ourselves or we can be deceived by the enemy into thinking that we're right when we're not really right. Uh, as Paul encouraged the Philippians, we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Uh, we don't base our faith on anything that we've done. We don't base our faith on an emotional experience we had in the past. We base it on the truth of God's Word and a relationship with God through Jesus. And get this, though our actions don't earn for us salvation, they do demonstrate the authenticity of what we claim. True faith endures to the end. I hope that you have this kind of faith yourself. And if you're just not sure, or maybe you don't know, or maybe you know that you don't have that kind of faith, please reach out to us today, and I would be happy to talk with you about how you can have the kind of faith in Jesus that perseveres to the end. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. I'll see you next time on the Midweek Message. <laughs>